Hi everyone and welcome to our uh, first lecture on white box testing methods. Um, white box testing is an alternative class of testing techniques to black box testing which we've covered in a few of the previous lectures. Um, the main difference between white box and black box um, is the fact that white box relies on knowledge about the internal workings of the software system and we'll see that when we discuss white versus black box in a second. Um, what I want to do today is give you an introduction. So we're going to talk about the different types of white box testing and the role white box testing plays as part of the overall quality assurance um, approach. Uh, we're also going to talk about how we can implement white box techniques and we'll cover, uh, cover, maybe that's a bad word. We will discuss two particular coverage methods for white box. Uh, one of them is called statement coverage, where we want our test to cover every single statement uh, in the code, uh, and meaning it ex at least one test executes every statement, and the other one is covering blocks of code. So let's get started on that. So white box versus black box. Um, black box methods we've already discussed. Um, these are techniques that are, have the benefit of you can actually do your tests and design them earlier before your software is even built. Um, they're, the tests you create are based on the requirements, specification, or in the case of gray box, you can use some of the design elements as well to design your test cases. Um, alternatively, what we're going to look at today is the white box methods. And these are methods that actually rely on the source code um, to base the test tests on. Um, so that means that we can actually leverage how the software is written to help us decide how to come up with a high quality set of tests. Um, whereas with black box we're really relying on what the software should do to come up with our tests. Um, so that's just sort of a general difference. Um, and then in terms of the different kinds of white box um, white box, similar to black box, one of the key ideas here is coverage, right? Um, we talked about coverage, input partition coverage, output partition coverage. Uh, we talked about uh, functional coverage as well uh, when we talked about black box. And the idea is with coverage is that it's almost impossible to do exhaustive types of testing where we test every single thing. So what we do is we come up with some method of coverage to provide us confidence that we are actually covering a representative set of, or we come up with tests that cover a representative, some representation of the software. Um, so what we're going to cover today uh, and discuss is the first uh, point here, which is code coverage. This is coverage methods which are designed to allow, to ensure that our tests that we create execute every method, statement, or instruction, or block at least once. So every test for every line of code, there's at least, with statement coverage, there's at least one test that causes it to execute. Uh, another group of white box testing, which we'll be talking about um, over the next uh, week or so, um, is logic based decision point coverage. This is where we actually look at logical paths to help us decide tests, so execution of the program. So, for example, we could look at um, every for example, you can look at every uh, possible independent path, right, which is a path that contains some other statement that isn't covered by other paths. Um, every possible independent path through the software you can make sure you have a test for. Um, and what you could also do is you could also do something like uh, decision coverage or uh, conditional coverage where you either cover, for example, for every if statement, the condition that you have there, you, you either cover the entire decision or you cover each part of the conditions in there. So if it said something like if x is less than 6 and y is greater than 0, um, you could have one test which causes that whole thing to be true, the whole thing to be false, or you could have a test to make sure the first part, the x, x, I don't remember what I said now, x is less than something is true and false, as well as y is equal to 0 is true and false. Um, obviously doing it where you break it down um, we'll end up generating more tests, but we'll actually provide you more uh, stronger type of coverage. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, not quite both true, each true, and neither. Um, it's actually each true, so you think of them independently. Uh, that's the difference. So it could be 
that you have one test case which causes both to be true and one that causes both to be false and that's totally fine. Um, what you're really trying to do there is you're trying to make sure that, especially in cases where it's likely that those are independent, the conditions, you don't want to have tests that only ever evaluate the first part and never evaluate the second part because if you made a mistake in the second part and instead of saying x equal or y equals zero, you said y is less than or equal to zero, if your tests never evaluate or care about that part, you may actually be missing that and you won't pick up that bug until somebody, a user, mo most likely during uh, a live run actually encounters it. So that's the kind of reason you do that. Um, another type of coverage we're going to look at is not about the paths or decision points. It's not about the code. It's actually about the data and the flow of data through the software. Um, so this is actually where we actually try to cover the different data aspects of the program. And data aspects are things like initialization, uh, assignments, uses of data where you read, so reads and writes, that kind of thing. And you try to cover the different data uses for different variables and provide coverage of those. So that a given variable, you make sure that you cover at least one read, one write, and one initialization or something like that. Um, and then the last group that we're going to look at is fault-based testing or mutation testing. And this is actually a, a topic that I've actually published on in the past. Um, and I can talk to you a little bit about it in probably a little bit more detail. Um, but um, the fault, oops, sorry, it went ahead by mistake. Um, the fault-based uh, mutation testing, the neat thing about that is, is what you're actually doing is, you're trying to assess whether or not your test suites are able to detect faults. So what you basically do is you come up with a common set of known faults uh, or to fault types. You apply that to the software. So for and then so for example, one common mistake is off by one errors, right? And that uh, an example of an off by one error could be something where instead of a less than, you have a less than or equal to as an operator. So what you do is you go through the program and every time you see a less than you create a separate version of the program where that one less than has now become a less than or equal to. So if there were 10 less thans in your program you now have 10 versions of the program each with one of those less thans as a less than or equal to. Make sense? And that's those are considered uh, faulty versions of the software or mutants. And then the idea is is that if your tests are good, uh, you want to know, can your test detect all of those variations, all of those common mistakes that somebody might make? So if you run your tests and your test can actually detect the difference, i.e. generate a different output for those mutant versions from the original, then we say the tests are capable of detecting those. Uh, and, and that's what we're doing there is we're trying to systematically seed errors throughout the program and see if the test can detect the difference between the programs with errors and the original. And this allows us, and the idea and the premise is, is that a program that can detect the seeded errors, uh, sorry, a test suite that can detect the seeded errors in a program it has a high likelihood that it can also detect real errors in the program. And the coverage is, is that you actually do this systematically where every place you could actually insert an error, you do it. So you could actually get hundreds or thousands of versions of the software system uh, when you're doing mutation testing. But it's actually kind of a neat idea and it's something you can also use to, as a way to generate tests automatically is something called the test oracle, which I'll talk to you about. Um, any questions about the different kinds of testing before I get into more specifics? Okay, hearing no questions, let's discuss a little bit about the role of white box testing. How is white box testing different from black box? And does it find the same kinds of bugs? Is it something that's uh, an alternative to black box testing? Can it be complementary and benefit you in addition to white, black box testing? That's the kind of thing I want you to think about here. And one of the things I wanted to mention is, is that white box testing actually has the opportunity to provide additional confidence in the software and 
additional confidence that you can find bugs in the software by adding an element of completeness to some black box methods. For example, one of the things we talked about with black box was shotgun testing, where we systematically use random values, right? Um, and well, you could actually use shotgun testing as a way to generate tests and then use statement coverage, a white box method, to decide when you're done, right? I'm going to complete, I'm going to keep generating shotgun, black box shotgun tests until every statement is executed by at least one of those tests. And that actually would allow you to then have uh, a completion criterion for shotgun testing. So you could use them together like that. Um, so that's one example of how white box testing could be used in combination with a black box method. Uh, another thing to keep in mind and why these are complementary is that they can actually, uh, they actually sort of find, well, not they actually, they do typically find different classes of errors. So a black box method, remember what a black box method is, tests that are created based on the specification or the requirements. So it's testing what the software should do, what inputs it should handle, what outputs it should give. So when you have black box tests that fail, typically they fail on errors of omission. That means something that you specified but failed to do or failed to do, you know, I guess failed to do in the software itself. So errors of omission are often what you find in black box testing. Whereas white box testing is much more focused on what we call errors of commission, which is something we've done but done incorrectly. Um, this is not to say that black box can find errors of commission. It's just that the types of errors it finds in general tend to be one or the other uh, in this case. So this is sort of more the dominant type of error you would expect to find that isn't typically dominant in the other class. Uh, another thing to keep in mind as well uh, is that um, white box testing is highly automatable. Um, so it's, it can be automated mainly because we're dealing with code, right? So unlike black box where we're creating the tests and that often sometimes prior to any code, we typically, some of those activities around test creation, output generation, those things actually uh, have to be done manually. Whereas with white box, because it involves the program code, we often can actually automate a lot of the different tasks and activities involved with white box testing to a larger extent than with black box, which is a, which is a benefit. Um, and although, of course, one of the things with uh, automation is we have to have an understanding of what we need to automate. So, for example, um, if we want to, um, let's just take one example here. Um, if I'm trying to cover every input, in a black box, right, and I've, I've got a partition, um, typically what I'm going to have to do is manually create tests that match all of my partitions. Or if it's output partitioning, I'm going to have to generate inputs that lead to outputs for each partition, right, and that's typically manual. Whereas with white box, we could try tests and we can validate uh, immediately if a given test causes a statement to execute, causes a branch to be true or false or whatever. But in order to do that automatically, what we need to do is we need to use something called code injection. How many of you have heard of code injection before? I'm betting you've all done it and don't realize it. How many of you have ever put a print, print statement in your code to see what the output is? Never, lol, okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of you do that because that's the way we kind of can debug and stuff, right? Um, some people, yeah, exactly. So that's actually a type of code injection. We're injecting code um, that is there to give us insight into how the software works. And it's not actually part of the software we're actually building, right? Um, so in general, um, injection, code injection is not a testing method, but it's a way to modify source code or executable code, and I'll, I'll explain the difference in a second, uh, in order to make, in our case, testing more effective. Um, and one example here would be, um, would be to actually, um, we could inject print statements into the code so that it prints out 
after every statement it prints or at every block of code it prints out that that block has been executed. The idea being is it gives us insight into uh, how the code is executing so that we can understand if we've satisfied our uh, coverage criterion. That's the main purpose of it. Uh, no, that wouldn't be in the project. So modifying the software in your project to take inputs from a file for testing purposes instead of a user input, that wouldn't be. And in fact, you're not going to need to do that in your code. Um, you're going to actually be using file redirection to redirect files um, to the uh, in at the command line. Yeah, exactly. That's what we'll, you'll be doing. Um, so, but we will be doing white box testing uh, in phase four. Um, and so stay tuned for that because you will need to do some most likely code injection for that. So often with code injection, we add extra statements or instructions that do not change the original program's behavior in terms of what it's supposed to do, but add additional information for logging or for checks for when we're running it. Um, so the idea is that the code that we add in for injection is not code that will remain in when we ship the program. It is code that is purely added for the purposes of our task, such as testing. Um, and often what you're doing here is you don't inject, although I'm sure a lot of you do with the print statements, you inject it directly in the original code, but a best practice wouldn't be to do that, it would be to create a separate version of the code that you inject, inject in and then keep so you have a separate version so instead of having to undo everything you do you can just discard it after as a and keep the original okay so that's a bit about code injection and then another thing is well what are code injection used for because I mentioned um, testing but there are different reasons we might want to inject code instrumentation is is the big one we'll see in white box testing okay that's where we add code to add to do logging of what statements get executed, what decisions get executed, and so on. So we're tracking properties of the execution uh, to help us assess coverage. Another type of code injection is adding code that logs information about the performance of the software, um, such as time or space, okay? Um, and so for example how much memory is being utilized would be an example although this one's a bit trickier because if you're doing performance instrumentation uh, adding logging code may actually impact if you're trying to look at timing if you actually add that into your actual code that you're timing uh, it can be a little challenging if you don't realize that hey adding logging information can actually increase the amount of time it takes so you have to be careful about how you do performance instrumentation. Uh, another type of uh, code injection is what we call assertion injection. And this is where rather than doing print statements, we actually insert, insert, we add, insert assertions into the methods, um, for example, before or after tests. And we've seen, we've talked about this a little bit already when I talked to you briefly about unit tests. Uh, back when we were talking about gray box testing. Um, and this is really helpful because assertions on what the idea about assertions, they have the same value of you putting in that print statement where you say print X is blah at a certain point in your code. What you're doing is you're giving yourself insight into the inner workings of the code the exact same way as if you were running with a breakpoint where you were checking the values at a, at a given breakpoint. Um, the idea here is, is that with testing, we typically are testing and determining if a test is correct or not gives the correct output by looking at the actual outputs of the software. But with assertions, we can check the status of and the state of different variables during execution. And if a variable isn't what it's supposed to be during the execution, an assertion could be violated and the program can stop because the internal state is wrong and we can find out sooner that there's a problem than if we had to wait for the test to run to completion. Um, a last thing is fault injection. And I've already just told you about fault injection, uh, which is the mutation testing. Injecting those mutants to create versions, that's a type of fault injection that we can do in order to help us to create a set of tests that cover those 
false that we insert. Okay, um, so that's another type of, of code injection. Any questions about those? Okay. So someone said, so a seg fault would be the last one. Well, uh, seg fault is a little different. So what's a seg fault doing? A seg, sorry, a seg fault or segmentation fault is an error that you can get um, due to uh, a, a memory. It's basically a memory access fault, right? Um, so what, that's an error that can happen when something goes wrong. Um, so accessing memory that doesn't belong to you. Often you see these when people are learning C++ with, for example, with pointers. So in this, in that case, a segmentation fault wouldn't be about instrumentation because it wouldn't be the result of you injecting anything into the code uh, unless you were actually injecting something to see if you could cause a segmentation fault, I suppose. Um, then it could be a fault injection, but in general, that would just be another type of output that you would see. So outputs that may come about from a test could be outputs you see at the command line, um, errors such as segmentation faults, uh, exceptions that get thrown in your code. Those are all different types of output um, that you might actually be tracking when seeing if a test passes or fails. Okay, so uh, just as a comment here, when it comes to white box injection, I did say source or executable, and I want to draw a distinction between this because um, you can actually instrument code at different levels, and there's value at doing it at different levels. Okay. Um, so when we do code injection, one way we can do it is at the source level, um, and at the source level, what do we mean by the source level? We're talking about, if we're talking about something like C++, we're talking about in the C++ source code itself, right? Java in the Java source code. At the executable code level, what are we talking about? In C++, we'd be talking about machine code, assembly, most likely. Okay, that's the executable code. And executable sampling, execution sampling, is when we actually do the insertion while the code is running, we actually do the insertion. And I'll talk about that in a second. So um, if we think about here um, the at the source level or executable level, what we're doing here is we're taking a copy of the program under test and altering it to inject additional source or executable code to log information such as coverage information. So we would be making a copy of either the C++ source code or the assembly code to actually do that. Um, in Java, we would most likely be talking about the Java source code or the Java bytecode would probably be what we would think about because uh, Java is an interpreted language, bytecode is what we interpret. So that would example would be to do the instrumentation in the bytecode level. Um, at the execution sampling level, it's a little different. So what we're doing there is we take the original program under test and we run it and we use timer interrupts where at a given point when the timer, when the interrupt happens, um, the current state and execution location uh, are sampled and logged. So what we're basically doing is we're randomly, rather than saying print out every time we're at a statement, we're basically just saying every two seconds, tell me what line of code you're at and what the values of all the variables are. And I, if I do enough samples, I can get uh, a very good idea of the internal workings of the software. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, I've got some examples. So let's look at the very first thing here. And I just realized oh, my highlighting is all off on my example, so I feel bad. Um, here's an example of some code uh, that we're going to do, and we're going to do code injection here. So. This code, um, what are we doing? Anyone know what this code is? Yeah, exactly. 
uh, we're basically just doing a, a binary search here, right? Get the midpoint. If the midpoint is the key in the list, then that's the result. Otherwise, check if the value at the mid is greater than the key. If it is, then let's look at the bottom half or the top half. Although this doesn't have the recursive calls in it, uh, it's just setting the high and low and that the rest of the code is off the screen. Um, so we can't really see that. In any case, what we could do is if we wanted to actually uh, modify this source here to cover it, to log the coverage, uh, what we could do is something like this. And you see how my highlighting is all off? I'm really sad about this. Um, but anyway, I, I'm not sure if it's because I'm running it through this other software for recording, it's thrown it off. But in any case, um, what we uh, what we can see here is everything in yellow basically are the is the code in, injected. Okay, so what I've done here is I've got print statements for every line of code, and this way, every time that print happens, it's telling me that the line that it's referring to was executed in the program. So this allows me to assess statement coverage of this code. So when I run a test. I can clearly see exactly what statements get executed. If I run 10 tests in a test suite on this code, all I have to do is look at the whole list and if there's a number missing, I know that statement wasn't covered by any of my tests. Make sense? Now an alternative to this is this actually is going to just print out every time in order it gets executed. We instead could actually do is we could actually instead keep track of how many times each line of code get executed. So we could have an array, the size of the number of lines of code, and all initialized to zero. And then what we do is we uh, add one or we increment the value every time. So we increment the value at uh, uh, index 18 every time line 18 is executed. And then at the end, which is off screen, we can print out the the list that says exactly how many times each line is executed and we'll see clearly which things have been executed zero times or which parts of code are not being frequently tested versus which parts of code maybe we're testing a lot more of. Okay, so this is two examples of code injection at a source code level. Now I also said we can do injection of code at an executable level as well. And in this case, again, we start with the exact same first step. Create a copy of the program code, uh, which you're going to actually insert the, inst the added instructions. Uh, now, uh, this is a little trickier because um, the, in, especially in the case of machine code, you're now going to be potentially referring to memory addresses in that in the code. So it, if you actually start adding things in, you could actually mess up information in your program. And let me just show you what I mean. So here's an example. Um, in this case here, these are the memory locations and the instructions, right? Uh, we've got variable names and we've got ours are registers right and then you see at the end we have this uh, jump equals 00A84 this is telling us at this point uh, we're gonna if we compared R4 and R5 and they were equal then jump to that line right because there's no if statements are there at machine level now the problem is if we start inserting stuff we could actually throw off where A84 is if we just insert a whole bunch of code to print, do print statements or try to do something like that. So we have to be a little careful with this. So how are we going to handle it? Well, here's how we can, one way we can handle it. Let's take a look at that exact same code again, okay? What we're doing here is, what we've done is now, because we don't want to mess up the memory order addresses of all of our assembly statements, what we're going to do is, if we wanted to increment, just like we did in the last one, we were keeping track of how many, how many times each uh, instruction is executed. What we could do, if we wanted to instrument and say, hey, load A, list 
comma R4 has been executed. Remember, if we go back and look at line 00A60, that line there is load A list R4. Instead, what we do now is at the end of our code, after all the memory addresses, so we're not messing anything up, we do a jump to late in our code, right? We load up the execu execution count. We add that value to it. So we add, right? We're going to add, sorry, we add one to that uh, index. And then what we do is we actually execute the statement we were going to execute originally. Then we jump back to the next line. So basically, we're, we've, we've basically added all the instrumentation code, but we've done it not in the order. We've jumped out to add it in a place where it doesn't mess up the memory locations of all of our other parts of the program. Right, so we kind of do this, in other words. Does this make sense? And this is only the code, this is way more tricky to do, because this is only the code to instrument one of these lines. If we want to do it for all the lines, obviously it's going to be more time consuming. Um, the reason you might want to do it, the machine code, um, there's, there's different reasons you could. One of them is sometimes you may actually have inline and assembly or you may actually be working with uh, code where you're actually optimizing the assembly code that's been generated from the C++. Um, or you want to have more detail on exactly what is happening. So um, often uh, one statement at a high in a high-level program programming language like C++ or Java can correspond to multiple statements at the assembly level. And it may be that you can't actually expose what the problem is at that level, and you want to go to a lower level to have a finer grain granularity to assess what's going on. Um, so there's reasons for doing this. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Okay, so we've covered what? We've covered source code uh, level, code injection, executable code level, injection. Uh, the last one is the sampling. So for sampling, um, we would have something like this. Um, so in sampling, the idea would be uh, is that we don't make any changes to the code. Instead, we have a timer that will interrupt the program and randomly sample it. Uh, and this is done at a low level, system level. And the interrupt will return the address to tell us where we are executing. Just that could be the, sys, the, the simplest thing, okay? So basically, if we don't do enough samples, we can see if the tests we're running actually execute every uh, instruction. Uh, and the yellow here is just simply saying, hey, if, if the timer goes off when we're just about to do that add, where the yellow is, well, at that point, if we do a sample, we would see that the program is actually, or, um, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, no, I, sorry, I just said, yeah, no, the, what am I saying here? Uh, Uh, let me see. I may have to re-record this lecture. That's okay. Uh, okay, yeah, no, what I was going to say was basically that at any point, this is the same code that we had on the previous, but instead of instrumenting, what we're going to do here is we're going to actually have a timer, and the timer will go off and interrupt, and we'll, we'll take, at that point, we'll take the memory address of the current statement we're executing, and we'll save it. Then a timer will go off again at some point. We'll take that address and save it. Um, if we do this through one execution of the program, we may only get a cut. We may only get say 30% of the statements that were executed. If, however, we run that test six different times, or five different times, or ten different times, or 100, we're likely to get all of the statements that it executes. Or if we run it over a large set and randomly sample, we're likely to get almost all of the statements that are covered. At least we'll get everyone at least once. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the idea there. Uh, we're not actually recording every statement that gets executed. We're sampling to the point where we do a large enough number to be statistically valid. 
Okay, great. So that's the last part of sampling. Um, the other thing that I want to mention here um, is that um, when we do white box testing, um, you know, and when we do things like code injection, especially at that at the execution level, we don't want to be doing that manually, right? I don't want to be doing writing jump statements and writing in new assembly code. So there are actually testing tools available that actually do all this instrumentation for us. And this is something to keep in mind is that that is something you can do. So a lot of these white box coverage testing tools um, that assess the coverage for you, they automatically do the injection for you so that you don't have to. So this is something that if you're using an existing white box testing framework, you likely will never have to do your own code injection. If you're doing an in-house framework, you may, the first time at least, have to build it. But more than likely, what you'll be doing is you'll be building code that will, will do the automated injection. You won't be manually injecting every time because that's just too tedious. Now, that's a little bit of a segue because what I did was I, I talked a little bit about um, after I covered sort of the general coverage types, I went a little bit into some of the tools and the technical details that you'll need to be able to assess different types of code coverage um, automatically with, with things like code injection. And what I want to do now is return to the white box coverage methods. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to uh, specifically look at code coverage today. And when I say I'm going to look at code coverage, um, that means I'm looking at um, two different groups. I'm looking at statement coverage and decision analysis coverage. Statement coverage, like we saw just then where we instrumented to say, hey, uh, line 18 executed, line 19 executed. That is flow independent. So when we actually just look at the coverage of individual statements or blocks of code, we are looking at them independent of how the code is executed. So it doesn't matter what order they're executed in. It only matters that that statement was executed at least once. Okay? However, the other group of code coverage methods are decision analysis. Those are flow dependent, meaning whether or not you have decision coverage, condition, loop, and path. Uh, I didn't mention loop before, by the way. Loop is just your, is like the decision coverage because you do have a conditional with a while loop, for example, except rather than just saying the, like an if statement that it executes true once and false once, with a loop you say it executes zero times once and maybe many, for example. Um, but those types of analysis, they're dependent on the path or the flow through the code, i.e. the order. So those are order dependent or flow dependent, whereas statement and base, basic block are flow independent. Today, we're only going to cover the flow independent methods, which means we're going to cover statement and basic block. But next time, we'll actually get into more detail and talk about decision analysis methods as well. So. Statement coverage. Um, we'll look at an example here. Uh, because I'm a little short on time, we're not going to do a breakout where we do this uh, as an activity in the class. However, uh, next time when I cover the decision based, I will do some breakouts so that you'll actually get a chance to uh, try some of this as well. Um, I just felt that for this one, uh, it was a little bit of a full lecture and the statement coverage in particular, I, I don't think it's necessary to do the example to see it. I think it's more important to do it at some of the other types of methods. So when we're talking about statement coverage, what we're really saying is, is that we want to make sure that our tests cause every statement in the program to execute at least once, which gives us confidence that every statement is at least capable of being executed correctly. Okay. The system for creating tests when you do statement coverage is for every statement in the program, independent of all the others, you write a test case which will cause it to execute. Okay? And use the same principles we talked about before, simple values. If one makes sense, use one. Don't use 1,682. Uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then the completion criterion is when we have a test case for every statement. And we check this by using instrumentation injection. So that's how we ensure our completion criterion is met automatically. 
So let's consider this code here. Um, this is the code that basically just reads in, it calculates numbers less than x which are divisible by y, um, which maybe sounds familiar if you were looking at the requirements that we talked about before. So it reads in an x and a y. If y is 0, it prints out y is 0. If x is 0, it prints out x is 0. Otherwise, for i equals 1, i is less than or equal to x. It's going to check if i mod y is 0, it'll print out i. Okay? I know I went through that a little fast, but what we would be, want to do here is we would actually want to go through and figure out for each of these lines of code what's a value of x and y that cause it to execute. So line number one, what values of x and y cause this to execute? Anything, right? It doesn't matter. It'll always execute. So we could just say 1, 1 or 0, 0. Line two, what value of x and y will cause that line to execute? Again, any. So we could just say 0, 0 again, or 1, 1 again, whichever one we chose. Same thing for line 3. Line 4, the same thing, right? Because statement coverage, we don't care if y equals 0 is true or false. Now, the first point we get to where we have to think a little bit is line 5. So for line 5 to execute, what, does, what can x be? anything. So let's say 1. What can y be? Only 0. So now we have that as a test for that line 5. Line 6. Line 6 now has conditions. So line 6 will only execute if line 4 is false. So y can't be 0 and x can be anything. So 1, 1 would work here, right? And then line 7, that will only execute if y is not 0 and x is 0. So 0 for x, 1 for y. And we can keep going through the whole program to get these values of x and y. And so we would follow this process where we would blindly make one test for each statement, one after the other. And you might say, well, isn't there going to be a lot of overlap here? And the answer is, yeah, there probably will be. But if you follow the basic rules about keeping the test simple, what you should end up with is something like this, where you ended up realizing that the value 0, 0 would, would cause, as a simple value, would be a value for a lot of the statements. So what you end up with is if you, if you kind of follow the same rules for simple values, you'll find a lot of the tests you create collapse into a smaller set of tests. If you instead just chose random values that worked, you would end up with probably 11 different tests. Or you could end up with 11 different tests. Make sense? So you try all the inputs and then you reduce it down to the number of tests. So you now have three tests and if you run these three tests, you can ensure that at least one of these tests causes every single statement in that program to execute at least once. Okay, so the very last thing I wanted to mention was um, basic block coverage. Okay, and a block is a different thing than a statement. So a block, you can think about the statements inside a for loop are a block. Okay, the statements inside a method are a block. Okay, so it's you think about the indentation, that's a really good indicator of blocks. Um, and the system here for block coverage is identify, what you're trying to do instead is identify all the basic blocks in your code, create a test for each basic block in order, and when you're doing that, you actually ignore substatements and stuff. Uh, and then you're done when every basic block has a test and you verify this by in using instrumentation injection again. So if we take that exact same code we just did, the first step in this case is identifying blocks. Anyone want to volunteer to tell me what they think the blocks are? <laughs> 
Well, let's think about, if you think about right, uh, let me turn on. So if you think about this here, you could think about this whole thing as being one block, okay? Because that's, if that was in a method, that's a block. But inside of that block, there are other blocks, right? This indentation, this is a block, okay? This is a block. This is a block. This is a block. This is a block. And this is a block. Basically, each indentation. <clears throat> so, what we have here is we have seven different blocks. Okay, and I've actually put it on the next slide, which looks a little bit neater, but this is the basic idea here. Okay, each of these is a block. So, when we're talking about executing block one, right? What we're really talking about is, if you just look right at the very start of that, what causes those lines at the beginning to execute? In x is y, x equals c read int, y equals c read int. What, what causes that to execute? That block. It, it's actually, it's this anything, right? So we choose the simplest value, 0, 0, right? The exact same thing we actually chose for the first statement there. If we then go down to block 2, what causes that to execute? X anything, Y zero. So we choose zero, zero again. For block three, we go down and check and okay, well, block three is gonna execute when Y is not zero and X is zero, right? Or no, actually no, not right. It's actually gonna be when Y is not zero and X is anything. So, um, for simplicity, we could just choose one, 0 for x and 1 for y if we want it. And then inside of that, 4, x has to be 0, y has to be not 0. So x is 0, so we go 0, 1 for x and y. For this, for the else, we now have to consider x, y is not 0, and x is not 0. So now that's 1, 1. If we go into the for loop, we check now, okay, what causes this six to execute? Well, six will execute uh, as long as i is less than or equal to x. So i starts out as one, so x has to be at least one. So if x is one, this will execute, right? If x is two, this will execute two times, three times, and so on. So if x is one and y is not zero, this will execute. So we can use the value 1, 1 as our test. Getting down to the print line, we now have to have a value. Let's say x is 1. So for i equals 1, what value of y will work here? 1 mod what will give us 0? One mod 1? Yeah. So if y is 1 and x is 1, then this print line statement will get executed, this block. So basically we do the exact same process that I just walked you through again. Create a test for each block one at a time, choosing simplest values. We'll get a set of results. But if we follow our process and always keep the same, uh, use the same pattern of simple values, we should be able to reduce down the number of tests we have for which is equal to the number of blocks down to a smaller subset of unique tests. And then that will be the case, right? And in this case here, what do you notice? If I go back here, what did you notice? What are, how many tests do we have with statement coverage? Three, right? How many tests do we have when we go to basic block? Three, okay. So in this case, statement coverage and block coverage are equivalent, okay? Um, this can vary a little bit, uh, it, but it has to do with sort of language features you use, use and so on. So uh, for example, if you use things like go-tos and that, you could see potentially uh, 
uh, or if you have unreachable code, uh, or there are other cases where this might actually, um, there might be slight variations, but in general, uh, don't worry too much about that. We're gonna mainly focus on statement coverage in the course as opposed to block coverage, but I did want you to understand the difference between them. Because while both of them in this case happen to be equivalent, and they're often equivalent, the methodology you use to choose them is different, right? So instead of going through 11 statements, we went through seven blocks. Okay. Um, so you can do coverage tests. Um, yeah, so what you what you basically do here, if you're doing basic block coverage, the idea is, is that you want to provide confidence by being able to say that every block can be executed at least once by some test. And the way we do this is we go through systematically through all the blocks, create an X and Y input that cause that block to execute. Once we have the full list of X and Y inputs and we've done it for every block, we stop, then we look at what we have and then we can reduce down the number of tests if possible. Okay, so um, that uh, concludes uh, our first lecture on white box testing. Um, what we've covered today is we've covered the general types of coverage methods, uh, which range from code coverage, which we looked at in detail today in terms of statement and basic block coverage, uh, which were the flow independent analysis techniques, uh, through to um, path coverage, decision point coverage, data flow coverage, fault based. We also took a deep dive into code injection and looked at the purposes of code injection. Three different strategies for code injection, namely source modification, executable code modification, and executable sampling or runtime sampling. Um, next time what we're gonna do is we're gonna do more methods and we'll, we'll do some uh, breakout group examples, namely with the path or I guess the flow dependent code coverage methods. Uh, and data coverage methods as well. So thank you very much everybody and have a great rest of your day.